Welcome to the 28 video in the Just In Case series sponsored by Quality and Equality, um, OD consultancy firm in Oxford. My name is Mei Yan Chung Judge and I am the founder and the director of the firm. We call it Just In Case. It's just in case you need to be reminded of something, just in case you want to learn or refresh some things. Today, I am so excited because our video is being shot by Julie Beden, a very dear friend and colleague of mine, who is, without any exaggeration, an international large group intervention guru. I remember one year in ODN, OD um, Network Conference, um, I think it's in New Orleans, when Barbara Bunker and Billy Auburn took me to dinner. And during dinner, they told me that I have to watch out for a UK colleague of mine called Julie Beden. And I say, why? And because they said they believe Julie will carry the baton on large group intervention after they are gone. Now, even at that time, um, Julie already are very well known for the amazing innovative work that she has done in the government, in medical um, circle. And so today I'm very excited because having actually reviewed her video, I can truly say, I don't think you could have learned so much about large group intervention from one video like the one that uh, Julie has just shot for us. Um, even just in part one, you will learn everything you need to know about large group uh, intervention. And then in part two, she goes into what we call the magic of the intervention, i.e. the principle behind the intervention design. Um, I am so excited that for those of you who really want to refresh your memory about large group or want to learn how to do it, this video will be significant resource to you. So Julie, may I say thank you and turn the time over to you. Thank you very much, Mayan. It's such a pleasure to do these videos for you. I've watched some of them and um, there's, there's great people in the videos. So I feel as though I'm amongst great company, really great company. And um, this large group interventions, as you know, has been a passion of mine and you and I met uh, with when Billy and Barbara introduced us when we were at the ODN conference in New Orleans. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet you there and share your passion for my passion, which is large group interventions. So I'm glad to be able to share it today. So one of the things people often ask me is how on earth did you get into large group interventions in the first place? Uh, and they've been asking me that for a lot of years. So I thought that was a good place to start this. I'm going to say something about uh, the history of large group interventions, but I'll say a little bit first about my history with them. So I was working for the civil service and we had been doing a, a transformation programme. It was based on the work of W. Edwards Deming and his 14 points from out of the crisis. We've been doing a lot of really good work on that. And we were very excited about what we were doing. But we'd reached a kind of impasse and we wanted to do more to actually empower and engage the staff. And would we have known the word engagement then? Not at all. But it was about getting the staff to really get excited about the change and feeling like they could do something and make a difference. So we went on a research trip and we went to, we went to America. We went to a load of places in America. And one of the places we went, now this was 1990. Two, so it's quite a few years ago, and we went to uh, Marriott Hotels. Now, um, the woman we went to talk about empowerment, and the woman kept telling us about this large group intervention that they were using and, and and getting very excited about it. And I wasn't really listening to her, and neither was Martin, who was my boss at the time. But one of the other women who were with, was with us suddenly said. I don't think we're listening. Um, this lady is, is telling us about something and we're trying to find something that she doesn't want to tell us about. Why don't we listen to her rather than trying to get her to tell us about something she's not interested in telling us about? And when we slowed down and we listened and what they were doing in Marriott's at the time is closing their hotels down and um, getting other hotels nearby to cover for them. And they were engaging the entire staff of the hotel from the 
cleaning staff right the way through to the top chefs in uh, a three-day strategic planning quality improvement event in which they developed a strategy for the hotel and planned a huge load of improvements. And it, it looked so fascinating. We came back and said, mm, well, maybe we should do that. And we asked who had helped them. And they said, uh, Kathy Dunamiller had been the person who'd helped them. So uh, my boss uh, rang Kathy up and said, could you help us in the UK? She said, well, I'm a guru, so I'm expensive. And <laughs> so she sent a colleague of hers, um, Robert, he's known as Jake Jacobs, and he came to the he came to the UK and we worked with him and his his colleague. And we did our well, I did my first ever uh, large group intervention in 1993, just as Billy and Barbara were doing their first special edition Journal of Ap Applied Behavioral Science. On, large, on the phenomena, the emerging phenomena of large group interventions. So that was my that was my first one. We had six hundred people. The area the area that we were working with um, was a twelve hundred person area, and all our local employment offices we close we we didn't close them. We kept them all open, but we had them all at half staffing, and every. Every office sent us half of every grade of staff from the admin people right the way through to their kind of senior managers. And we had 600 people and over two days we created strategy live um, and it was just amazing. So before we did that event, our region was the worst performing region in the country and that particular area were the worst performing area in the country and within six months they were the top performing area in the country it was so phenomenal the way in which it engaged everybody in the system so we had we had unemployed people there we had employers there we had the whole system in the room and we did some really exciting work and from then on I was sold on the power, what I call the power and possibilities of large group interventions. So uh, Billy and Barbara were the first people to discover the phenomena of large group interventions. And I know there's another video and, 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 and Barbara has said a lot about what they were doing at the time and what they saw. And um, Billy and Barbara have become really good friends of mine. When I, when I first started to work with large group interventions, I was only working with one methodology. And one of the things that Billy said, she had, I had dinner with, it, with her in a Greek restaurant in London, because Jake said I should meet her. And she said, you're in the, you're in the UK, you can't afford to specialise in one intervention. You need to learn as many as you can because the UK market's so small, you can't afford to specialise. And so from then, I embarked on a journey to learn as many as I could. Um, and that means that I'm now probably uh, one of the people in the world who's been trained and used like most of the large group interventions. And I think one of the ways in which you can look at the history is look how the definition has changed over the years. So when Billy and Barbara were writing in 1993, they didn't even define what large group interventions were. They said, it's a new type of social innovation in OD practice, working with the whole system by enhancing everyone's understanding of the system and its context. And that's as much as they did. I've searched all the way through that first jabs, that, 19, that, that 1993 jabs, and that's the best you can find. And then in 1997, they wrote, I think, which is one of the best books on large group interventions. Um, and that when they wrote that in 1997, they had actually landed a definition by then. And they said then, therefore, organisational and community change, methods for involving the whole system, internal and external, in the change process. That's one of the things in the history that I think that's quite important. It is the whole system, internal and external. It isn't like a town hall or a, or a meeting where you just get the staff together. It has the whole system. It has customers and suppliers and all kinds of people in the room. 
Um, uh, the latest intervention, uh, the latest definition that is around is by a Dutch lady called Tony van der Zouwen. And she did, a, she, she's one of those amazing women who has a PhD in chemistry, moved over into OD and then, des- <laughs> and then did another PhD on large group interventions. And what she was trying to look at was, do they work? And, and, and if they work, why do they work? And she, she, did, um, she did some of her PhD using large group interventions. So she did an open space and she did some other things. And she had Marvin Weisbord, Sandra Danoff and, and several of the people in the field, part of the process by which she, she got the book written. And she, I think, did w- what's a much better definition of where we've reached with large group interventions. And she said, it's a trajectory for change or learning in which stakeholders of the whole system, organisation or community or its context are invited to contribute in all stages of the trajectory. On one or more occasions, the whole system is invited into one room to address address strategic needs. And that, for me, embraces the multiplicity of different types of large group interventions they are and gets across the notion that it's not a one-off event. So when we're calling them large group interventions, the interventions is, is multiple, not just one. It's not just an event. And, and and that's I think quite an important thing that has grown over over the time of understanding them. And Billy and Barbara do a really when they, they used to run a three day large group interventions training session, and we brought them to the UK three or four times to run that session. And a lot of people, um, a lot of people that I I even took uh, at the time I was in Litchfield Diocese, and I was wor- I'd been working with the diocese. And I'd been doing some large group intervention work with them. And so I took the bishop with me <laughs> to learn directly from Billy and Barbara about large group interventions. So uh, I, I, I've i been sharing this work for, for many years. And they do a lovely map of the history. In their map of the history, what they make note of is that there are it's it emerged out of three steps three streams of of work um, that you had gestalt psychology and Lewin and NTL and Lippitt and you could put into that into that a whole load of other people but that's that stream it, it went from Lewin in the 60s into the formation of NTL um, and then uh, Ron Lippitt's work and, and, and some of the stuff that he did in the 70s so that's one stream of work which is about groups and how groups function and how groups work and um, how groups are with one another. Then the central stream that they all connect off is the systems theory stream, which starts off with von Bertalanffy, who was one of the first people really to ever say that, um, you know, to see the organisation through that systems lens. And then and then has been built on by Katz and Can, Rice, Oshri, um, Dick Beckhart's work. And um, I include when I'm looking at that stream, I include um, one of my old mentors, which is uh, Deming, because he used to say you have to have an appreciation for a system. And he talked a lot about understanding the system, understanding the psychology of the system. And I, I think he would have, uh, had he lived beyond the early 90s, he would have lived, loved um, some of this. Um, and then the final stream is the psychoanalytic psychology, Beyond's work on how people behave in groups, basic assumption behaviour, the centrality of, of having a meaningful task, and Tristan Emery's work. Um, and, and one of the first ever large group interventions, we Brits can claim this one, was Tristan Emery. They did a lot of work in, in the coal mines around self-managing teams, but there was a, um, an event in Bristol, and I think it was Hawker Sidley, it was a merger, and they wanted to do some strategy work. And Tristan Emery did the first ever search with them 
um, saying it's not about some senior managers just writing a strategy. It's about getting the system in the room and exploring the past, present and future of the system. And that's how you that's how you get good good strategy so you get the intertwining the understanding of groups the understanding of systems and then the, and then the understanding of um individuals and self managed uh, you know the psychodyna- the psychodynamics of of self managed people taking responsibility for themselves and that lands you in the territory whereby as all that came together in the 1990s a lot of large group interventions emerged simultaneously. So you've got the search conference, which w- was built built on the Tristan Emery routes. Marvin Weisbord, um, at the end of production productive workplaces, he talks about future search and how and how future search emerged. And I know he's done one of these videos. He can't possibly have done that without mentioning future search. But that emerged as a way of bringing whole communities, whole systems together to do strategic planning. Kathy Dannemuller um, and her team did real time strategic change. That's also known these days as whole scale but it's the same body of work the um in the institute of cultural affairs i think it was did the their strategic planning process which um that was doing a lot of work with indigenous communities and and they did a lot of work with 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 Community, it's very community based that one is and there's a lot of resources that have come out of that in terms of how do you have really good participative con they've done a lot of stuff on participative conversations and getting people um, to participate um, then uh, I think the work that came out of GE around work design uh, workouts uh, there's there's another branch of Emery's work which was participative design which was also large groups, but that was designing organisations from the bottom up. Then you've got uh, workout and you've also got open space. Now, the list goes on because then what started to happen is you got people like Dick and Emily Axelrod who started going, oh, well, you could put some of this together. So they took STS and 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 all that socio technical systems understanding and future search bolted them all together and said here's a new way to design organizations with large groups uh, being involved now often when i show this image when i'm covering this in 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 ntl and i show this history people say so it all stopped in the 1990s it, and i say no 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 it emerged in the 1990s so much has been built on it since. Um, so you've got Theory U and their Change Lab, and that is a mega, a, a, a mega large scale intervention at, at the level of, of really, really big systems. And they've done some amazingly large whole system work. But it's uh, in Tony van der Zaan's category where you've got multiple interventions all coming together. Uh, then there are lots and lots now of emergent, um, more mini change processes that are more conversational change processes for working in ordinary meetings in more liberating ways. And Lisa Kimball uh, and, and her team did some great work um, uh, on uh, what she calls liberating structures. Yeah, and you can look that up on the web. And there's loads of really good stuff in liberating structures on how on how you can have different types of conversations with large groups of people. And I, when I first sat and listened to Gervais talk about Dialogic OD. He puts his slide up about the methodologies that use Dialogic OD, and every large group intervention that I knew was on that slide. I kind of like looked at it and thought, "Oh, oh, I know Dialogic OD. <laughs> that's how." I, and, and my colleague was sitting next to me, and he said, "Oh, that's you. That's how you work." <laughs> so that's uh, that's kind of like. The, the story, uh, as it were. Now, there's another way you can look at this story. And I think Mayan, um, people may have seen Mayan do this before, but she talks about this story using Marvin Weisbord's picture. And what Marvin says in Productive Workplaces is, 
we started uh, at the beginning of this century when we started even looking at management science and management theory and there were you know the first ever consultants and in those days experts went in they did kind of time and motion studies and they came in and solved problems and that moved on and what we saw emerging in the 50s and early 60s and some of Deming's work was quality circles and employee participation um, processes whereby everybody solved problems. So you got people together but to solve problems. And uh, then we moved in to start looking at whole systems. Instead of being in problem solving, experts solving them or groups of people solving them, we shifted over into looking at the whole system. And when we first shifted into looking at whole systems in the mid 60s, in those days, experts improved whole systems because it was experts that could understand whole systems. And where what large group interventions enabled us to do is to let everybody in participate in improving whole systems. And that's the journey from experts and problem solving right the way through to the whole system working together to improve the system. And, and we see, I, I see so much of that around nowadays. People talk about co-production, co-creation. They talk about dialogic processes. A lot of people talk about conversational change. There's, th this has become embedded. And you know, the very first time we did a large group intervention uh, in a hotel and we put round tables into the room and we, we were setting it all up for hundreds of people all seated at round tables. It was a phenomena in the hotel. Everyone was coming and looking into the room like, is this for a meeting? There's flip charts at every table. This is weird. Nowadays, I think whenever you go to large meetings in organisations, they sit people around round tables. Now, they might all be looking at a screen and listening to presentations all day, so it might not <laughs> have the full features of a large group intervention. But, but the social architecture of large meetings has significantly changed because of the large group intervention uh, movement. And one of the things people often ask me is how large is large? And the answer to that question is it's not all that simple. Uh, but but Beyond's work, work and some of the other work around the dynamics of groups suggests that once you've got 15 or more people in a group, then you start to get into the dynamics of large groups because I can't, I can't, I don't have enough airtime and I can't follow normal conversational flow. So I can't say what I'm thinking when I want to think it. And so my, my thinking patterns and my speaking patterns become disrupted. So that's the a kind of a good rule of thumb that once you're over 15, you ought to be thinking, how am I going to manage this to take account of the fact that large, to some extent, large group dynamics will be at play? And you, we, you can easily lose people. Um, and that's that's actually to some extent true, even once you get above eight. If you watch a room full of people and, and I've experimented with groups of size, eight, nine, ten, what have you. If you go up to about 10 or 11, you can see some people. You look around the room and you can see some people. They've pushed themselves back. They've got their they're they're not they're not part of the group. So you want to maintain that group group cohesion so they become a group there's a there's an interesting debate around this because uh kathy danamiller used to say the unit of change is the small group so you go from the individual you create a small group you go from the small group to the whole room then you come back from the whole room into the small group and back to the individual that's because Kathy worked with really big groups of two, three, four, five, six hundred. Marvin Weisbord will say that the unit of change is the whole group. 
So he doesn't work with groups of much more than maybe 64 to 81. So he he keeps it more of a median group size because they can all see the whites of each other's eyes and they can have a whole group conversation. But the bigger you get, you can do it, but you, the bigger you get, the harder it is to do that whole group in that whole group conversation. So that I think is the first question people ask me, like how, what's large? Um, and then I think the next question that's worth ask, asking, it, answering is, well, practically, what is it that they, what is it that they do? I think if I come into what is an NG, LGR, like why would why would you even bother with one? And it's my belief that what large group interventions do is they accelerate change. They have the potential and possibility, they contain within them the the potential and possibility to accelerate change in a system. Um, And over the years, I've developed a model of of why is that the case? What, What needs to be in place to have that be the case? And... I put I always put at the center you've got to progress real work. If you're only giving people information, if you're only telling them things, if you're only um getting them together in a playful way, you're not progressing any real work, you will lose them. From, from we know that from beyond and the basic assumption stuff that you can easily lose people. So I spend a lot of time in the planning process of a large group intervention figuring out Um, Marvin calls it, what's the task, Uh, purpose, whatever, mission, what are we trying to achieve? What's the work that needs doing and what kind of outputs will we get that people will think are meaningful and worthwhile and worth working on? And then you surround that with three things. You want to have the conversations go up the system, down the system and across the system. So the across will be coming in from outside the system, from customers and suppliers, but also across all the functions within the system. You've got to let the top, because the top sees things that the bottom doesn't, you've got to let them talk, but you've also got to give voice to the people at the bottom. And that that conversations that go in all those directions, that's got to be part of the design. You've got to really be thinking about all the different directions of the conversations. The second thing you've got to have in place is you've got to allow voice and influence. So if if, if there's nothing for people to shape, if, they're, if they can't find their voice and, and make themselves heard and feel like they've influenced, then you're, you're, the acceleration that you're going to get is, is going to be a lot less. And it's quite it's quite interesting. I remember one of the things in my very first set of evaluations, I remember reading them and we did a one of the things we did in that design is we we had brought we we'd done a lot of several leadership events beforehand and we brought in a draft strategy. Um and that was last thing we did on the first day. And everyone in the room commented on the draft strategy with doc voting, with a combination of doc voting and writing comments. And the leadership team worked overnight till about two in the morning, integrating all of those comments. Now, some of them, they said, um, we we heard this, but we're not going to change it. And here's why we're not going to change it. But most things they changed to take account of what the people in the room had told them. And uh, the... One of the things that people said in the evaluations is my little voice was heard. And the fact that they said little voice, because when you're one in 600 and you're quite junior, you feel like your voice is little. And if you can leave feeling I was actually heard and listened to at my table, but in the whole room, then you then you feel powerful and empowered afterwards to go away and do things. The other thing is... The events themselves, the interventions themselves, should embody the desired future you're trying to create. 
And the example I always give of this is one of my early pieces of work. I went to work for a company and they they were planning their first ever global uh, meeting. And they'd got the kind of they were they were a very big global organization that I won't name. And they were bringing together all their chief executives from all their different companies, 120 of them for the first time ever. It was big stakes. It was a big stakes meeting. And when I arrived, they'd already done some of the design work. And one of the things they were going to do on the first day to get everybody warmed up was the, the, the purpose of this session, the kind of overarching reason for it, was to get them to collaborate more as a whole organisation. That was the purpose of it. Good purpose, yes? So their first day, they thought they'd play a really interesting competitive game and the losers wouldn't get any dinner. <laughs> so I kind of said, mm, I don't think that's a very good idea. And I talked to them about this notion that comes out of Cathy Miller of real time, that the change happen, has to happen in real time. So if you want to move towards collaboration have what you do at the event be collaborative. So we changed the game. We changed the, I don't, I'm not a big fan of playing games because it's not real work, but we changed what they did that first day to be more of an exercise in collaboration so that they experienced the kind of collaboration they don't normally do uh, as chief executives. So that's, that's my best example of how wrong you can get it. But we can all, the idea is that we pull the future that we want into the now so people get a, get a hit of it in real time. Now, it, it, it's, there is an artificiality to it because it might not be sustainable every day, but you get enough of a hit of it to want to do it more. That's the, that's the notion of that. So that's, if you get all those together, if you give people an experience of new ways of working, if you really allow them voice and influence, if they feel like they've really achieved some real work that is going to make a difference, and they've had all these conversations with people they wouldn't normally talk to, that will accelerate change. That's the that's for me what I've learned is the is the essence of how this works. So loads of organizations do large events. Everywhere I go, they they have large big meetings. And what I've learned is those large events aren't always large-scale interventions. Just because it's a big event doesn't mean it's a large group, large-scale intervention. Because most of the large events that people have um, in organisations, they only have the internal system in the room. And they might not even have the whole of the internal system. They might only have senior leaders or they might only have a certain number, a certain type of person. Whereas what, what I, what, when they're at their best... Large group interventions have the dynamic system in the room. So they have some unusual voices in there. They have people that are not normally in the room. So clients, customers, whole load of people who are not norm who are not normally in the room. Levels maybe in the organization that you wouldn't normally involve. Um, they most large events at best cascade information and then get people to discuss it. They might do a little bit more than that, but they don't do much more than that in a lot of cases, rather than have people actively participate. And they get people to share with one another rather than engage in a real action learning inquiry where they're really in, in the space of discovering, reflecting on their own reactions and really kind of moving things forward. And one of the clues for me that what people are talking about is a large event rather than a large group. And I can I can actually do really good work to design really good large events. That doesn't make them large group interventions, but they're better than they would have been <laughs> as large events. But one of the clues that we're in large event territory is when when I'm asking people about, you know, the, the desired outcomes or what they want is we want people to recognise that. 
that they need to do this. We want people to recognize the importance of this. We want people to. Re- so the word recognize and recognition is a clue for me that we're more over in that territory. Because I think what happens when you're in the territory of large group interventions is you're doing much more sense making and meaning making than recognizing. So if if I go and a client says to me, what we need to do is we all need to make sense of what's happening. I know I, I'm thinking, all oh, right, so we could really be in LGI ter- territory here. And large events tend to keep people in their role, whereas the large system events, they, they engage with the person as a whole person. So you'll always find a lot of movement, You'll always find that there's a range. The way the the way the events are designed is they engage the rational person and the emotional person. So they're designed thinking about people as whole people rather than just people doing jobs. Um, so I I invented that to try try and help people think what territory I am, what territory am I in? And Tony Van der Zouwen in her book did this really brilliant uh, kind of graphic that I've used time and time again, where she uh, uses Brian Smith in in the red change, uh, what's it called? In the fifth discipline. So Peter, Peter Senge's fifth discipline field book. It's a big fat red book. Uh, if you've not got it, should be on your shelves. I've got two copies for some reason on my shelf. <laughs> Don't know why there's two there. But in that, Brian Smith did a really lovely diagram uh, where he talked about um, the the range of different uh, ways in which you can intervene. You can tell people things. You can sell things to them. You can test things with them. You can consult with them and change them as a result of, of, of what they said. Or you can co-create with them. And he said that he, he draws it like as a X, Y axis and said the more important it is for everybody to be involved in the change, the further up the co-create line you need to go. That's That was his original diagram. And Tony van der Zaun very cleverly took that diagram and overlaid the large group interventions that, that, that she was looking at over the, over the model. So she puts company-wide meetings... Co- most conventional conferences and presentations sit in tell sell because you're being told things or you're being sold things. And I have to say, having been conference designer several times, the number of people who who offer to do presentations and what they want to do is sell something to the audience is <laughs> is 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 it's not unusual. So that's why they why they sit in that in that place and company wide. Team briefings, company-wide meetings, cascade kind of sessions, town halls and that kind of thing often sit in that cell territory. So they've got a message. If 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 anyone says to me, we need to get buy-in, I say, well, what are you what so what are you selling? <laughs> So, so they're in, they're definitely in cell territory if they're saying they want to get buy in. So that's a good, it's a good, uh, you look, I, I look out for clues. <laughs> and, and then you, you do have some kind of conferences that are much more exploratory and they have syndicate work and report backs and that kind of thing. Um, and they're in that, in that kind of testing ideas, exploring things mode. Then you shift over into starting to consult and co-create. So most of the of the searchy kind of methodologies, quite a lot of the methodologies sit right up in the co-create end. Search conferences, future search, all of those, all they all sit up that far end because they blank sheet of paper. People in the room are going to create it from scratch. It's a scary thought. People can do it, and then. Open space spans consulting and creating because you can do an open space in in kind of consultative mode or you can do an open space in co-creative mode. You wouldn't really do open space to tell people things. (laughs) You you really wouldn't. But I I have done them both in consult mode and in co-create mode. And then real-time strategic change is one of those very, very flexible methodologies because there isn't a fixed process. 
there's a there's a there's a set way of designing them and and you can you can design them to test ideas you can design them to consult or you can design them to co-create so it's one of the one of the much more flexible methodologies now if if everyone was in a room with me at this point i would say to them okay so and and you could all stop the video now and ask yourself this question <laughs> put it freeze it up with this picture in 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 your mind and then think where do most of where where do most of our large meetings sit in our organization and typically when i get a group of people who come um, to learn about large group interventions i'll get some that are up at that co-create end i'll get a lot down at the tell end and and a lot the lower side of middle, so they're in that cell, they're in that cell and test space, and we talk about what could you do to move, and do you, do you, do you even need to move them further up, and what would you do to move them further up, and uh, I, I think you can relate that to my original triangle model. How many of those four factors are important to you? Is it important for you to accelerate change? And is getting real work done, embodying the future, having those conversations that go up, down and across the organisation and giving people voice so that they can influence the change? Is that important to you? Because if all those four things are important to you, then it is worth moving your m meetings up to the to the far end of the scale. So that's a, a point of reflection that you could sit back now and ask yourself, where, do, where, are, my, where are my meetings and where would I like them to be? Because that could get you to think about, could I, use, could I use large group interventions differently? And the more, the more complex your environment, so the more you're in that complexity space, the more valuable. In, in these times, especially the post-COVID times, that'll date this video, <laughs> especially in these uh, early, we're not even post-COVID yet, in these COVID times, uh, we've been in the chaos of COVID and now we're in this space of complexity and we kind of like, everyone's talking about the new normal and we don't really know what normal is anymore and we're thinking about future of work and the future of everything. These kind of methodologies really let you use what Marvin Weisberg calls the wisdom of the group, the wisdom of crowds, all of that kind of thing comes in if you decide um, to engage uh, large groups. And when, when we get to the next bit, I'll talk a little bit about uh, using large groups in virtual space because I'm, 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 I'm currently experimenting with that. So the, the final slide in this section about uh, large groups and, and how they work is uh, when we say they work, how what, what do they get you? So I've said accelerated change. Fortunately for me, the lovely Tony van der Zaun did research on this. And what I did is I've taken Tony's uh, research and added my own experiences to create a kind of table of what are the short-term effects and what are the sustainable effects. And even if it's a one-off large group intervention, and I'm not a big fan of those, you will, you will achieve... If you if you design it well, you get a really good design team who know the system, you will achieve the objectives you set out for yourself at the event. You will increase awareness in the whole system of the whole system. Nobody can leave one of those events without understanding that there's their perspective on the system is is not the same as everybody else's. Uh, the, the most common thing people leave saying, I, I do a, a very open evaluation um, saying, you know, what have we achieved? And uh, I, I don't get them to do like tick boxes like her type thing. I, I, I just ask them the open question, what have we achieved today? And one of the most common, common answers to that is new networks and new relationships. So you will get those. Um, you often get people saying they, they're committed to and energised for the change. Um, and the better the event is, Cathy always says, you, you, she always used to say, rate it on a scale of one to ten. If you And ask a hard question. Don't make it easy to give a high score. 
And if you're getting scores seven, eight and above, the system's empowered. If you're getting lower scores, they still don't feel empowered for some reason. So something didn't quite work in the way that it went. But you will get a lot of commitment and energy for change. And you will, whatever it was you set out to learn about, you will um, have a learning. The other thing is because the way some of the processes work around self-managing and the group managing itself, people learn new ways of working together and taking responsibility for themselves. So you get some some real learning about group process just from the experience of, 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 a, good, of a good group process. Long term, when I've worked with organisations where they've been ready and willing and able to do like Tony calls this whole change trajectory with lots of large group interventions, what you then get is um, that the collective learning and the, and, the, and the conversations continue well beyond the event. And I've worked in organisations where they've had a very, we did, uh, there was one uh, that um, Jake and, and some colleagues, we all worked on down in um, New Orleans I wasn't actually at the large event, but I almost know in intimate detail what happened at it because I would go to so many of the follow up events and things that we were doing. And people would say, so what did we say in the large event? And they could almost be present to each other because they'd been in the room and had that experience. They could be present to themselves as a whole system. So the capacity for change increases. People get better at doing systemic think thinking. Some of the boundaries start to break down. And the new ways of working, if you've done a good job of embedding them in the events, they start to become the way the system works. Um, and communication becomes a lot more constructive. I'm going to quite, quite, quote a friend of mine, Jill Steele, who once wrote a lovely paper, having been to several of uh, Kathy's events, and he said, the magic is in the principles. So that's, that's the kind of subtitle to this, to this part of it. Uh, so if I, if I start with looking at what Tony van der, van der Zaan came up with, uh, which is around the essential reasons why they work, and then and, and she says, when they do, because she doesn't conclude that they always work. So the essential reasons why they work when they do is that, that you're applying principles grounded in theory. So not only do you know the principles, but you know why those principles matter. You know why they're important. The, the second thing is you've got to really be working in a system where there's some readiness to engage. So you don't really want to force hundreds of people to come into a room. You want them to be ready. So there has to be some kind of pressing situation that mean people are ready to engage. And I would say if you haven't got that kind of pressing thing, don't bother to do large groups. It's a waste of money. So have something that <laughs> that you're ready to engage the whole system in and have some really worthwhile work to do. So readiness to engage in worthwhile work, a diverse mix of people. I think it's Marvin who said, if you put the same people in the room, you're going to get the same things. <laughs> so if 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 you're looking and thinking this is all the same people, if you're looking and thinking, ooh, this is a bit scary, you might you might just be in for a real treat. And then uh, then and finally, you've got to have conversations that change hearts and minds. Not just minds, not just hearts, hearts and mind, which is that, and get that, that the whole purpose. And all a large group event is, uh, it, in, in its simplest form, 
is a series of really, really good conversations. And I know that I've got a really good design when a participant runs over to me and says, what we should do next is such and such. And I say, oh, good, that's exactly what we're doing. (laughs) <laughs> and that's when you know that that you're you're on a roll and this is flowing the way people people want them to do so i thought about this uh thing of gills that the magic's in the principles and i thought but they're all different and they are if you look at the different people who talk about large group interventions they have different sets of principles and they're different but aligned so Auburn and Bunker tried to search for a set that kind of spanned all the lot and they said um, their first principle is including all the stakeholders so get all the voices there engage multiple perspectives now you can get all the people in the room but if you only talk about what an what a small number of people want to talk about. So if you get everyone in the room, but you only talk about what the senior leaders want to talk about, then you've not you've not engaged those multiple perspectives. So part of what you've got to do is let c- keep coming at the discovery work from loads of different angles. The opportunity to influence, which is in my diagram, and the search for common ground is the final thing that that they've got. Now, if I go along the way across inclusion of stakeholders, different people talk about it in different ways. Jacobs and Dana Miller talk about creating community. Axelrod's talk about widening the circle of involvement. Wiseboard talks about getting the whole system in the room. And uh, Cooper Ryder Watkins in AI, which strictly speaking, isn't a large group intervention, but is often used in that mode. And I'm currently doing a big, big change process using AI, which effectively is turning out to be something of a large group intervention. And they say it's the poetic principle that people co-author the story. The way Engage Multiple Perspectives shows up is building understanding, connecting people to each other. Wiseboard talk, and this is my favourite version. I I have like favourite versions of each of these principles. The one I like is the Explore the Whole Elephant one. So Marvin Wiseboard tells the Sufi elephant story of, you know, you've got all these wise men and they're blindfolded and they go and they're asked to describe an elephant. And one says, oh, it's like a wall. And another one says, oh, it's like a snake. And another one says, no, it's a hose. And they're all right. And they're, none of them have the whole picture. So you, you're trying to really put that whole elephant together. Um, and in, in, in AI, they talk about the constructionist principle of discovery. So what you're trying to do, a principle you've got to be doing is, is being on that road to discovering things that you, that, that you don't know. So everybody learns something about the system that they didn't know. Now, then you've got a, a, a sneaky line that Billy and Barbara don't talk about. And um, there are uh, two versions of that. In Jacobs and Dallamilla, they talk about reality as key driver because they're saying we don't deny the reality of what's happening in the system. And then there's almost like a counter to that in AI that said we use the positive as a source of energy. And, and, and both are similar but different <laughs> in terms of how do we, how do we treat the, the, the situation? Um, the opportunity to influence. Jacobs and Dallamella talk about real, the, the notion of real time, which I've spoken about already. They also talk about engagement. Axelrod's talk about embracing democratic principles and they've always had a lot of kickback on that principle because a lot of people say organisations are not democracies. But by democratic principles, they're talking about if you say we're co-creating and then some voices are more important than others, you're not really embracing democratic principles. So if you don't want to co-create, then you're in consult mode and don't pretend you're in co-create mode. Um, so, uh, and then uh, Wiseboard talks about self, self-management and responsibility for action. And, and he has this thing, if you're in a large group and 
they ask him, what are we meant to be doing? His answer was always, well, what do you want to be doing? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I gave you a task, but what do you want to do? What do you want to talk about? <laughs> this is what we're looking at. But what do you want to be doing? And so I, one of the things I learned a long time ago is not to interfere in the tables because they'll do what they need to. And if you've got 50 tables in the room and some of them are doing the task differently than others, they will have different insights and it will be interesting. So I don't need to obsess and go around and check everybody's doing the work because I can just wait and see what emerges from it <laughs> and just trust that they'll do something good because they'll be doing what they need to do. Um, so I, I I really do like that one. And um, Cooper Ryder Watkins talk about the sim simultaneity of being able to ask questions and have conversations. And I think that connects in with that opportunity to influence. In that search for common ground, Jacobs talks about preferred future. So not focusing on solving problems, but finding a preferred future. Um, Wiseboard talks about future focus and common ground. So focus on the future and find common ground about the future rather than trying to agree what the worst problems are and stuff like that. Axelrod talks about creating communities of action so that it, it isn't people talk. All too often we get employees or if you're doing community events, I've seen it far too many times, local councils or health organisations have big events. They get the public in, they ask the public what they want, the public tell them and then the 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 local authority officials or the health service officials go away and say, oh, it's no use asking the public, they ask for nonsense. Because you're not inviting them <laughs> to, to create a community. So, so rather than asking them what they want, ask them what they want to make happen and ask them to participate in making it happen. And it's a very, very different dynamic than just asking people what they want because you're just creating wish lists and, and what's the point in getting hundreds of people together for them to give you a wish list of things that you know you're not going to be able to give them? So give them all the system realities. Give them all the information. I've, I've done um, community health events where um, we've been looking at, at budgets and I've given them poker chips and said, where do you want to spend the money? What, where would you put? If this is all the money you've got. Where would you? How would you spend it? Where would you put put the most of the money? Uh, and it's very fascinating because that's them. That's not them creating a wish list, but it is them thinking about if if there's a fine out amount of chips, where do I put them? Um, and uh, in in AI, they talk about the collective imagination. So those, so uh, what I would often do if I'm working with a group of people at this point. I might ask them to think about the change in their organisation and what what set of principles, if they were putting a set of four or five together for their organisation that would be rooted in theory but would shape their change, which principles might they pick from these or how might they, how might they um, shape a principle of their own and what theory would they base it on so, they, so that you can think about what does it mean to work? What does it mean to start from principles? Tony van der Zand, you, you see how I rely on her book a lot. <laughs> she she did this, uh, which is a different way. So I, I created a matrix. I like matrices. <laughs> I like a bit of logic. But she created this lovely systems map of, of principles, trying to show that all the principles are interconnected. Um, and, and you can see there. And so sometimes I say, draw your own systems map of, of, of principles that you're that you're working with. So the, the next art of working with principles is that the, the first set that I talked about, they're the methodological level of principles. So if I'm working with this methodology, I'm working with this set of principles and they hang together as a as a full set if i'm working with that method 
so so there, there's a there's an integrity to that set, um, and then they shape the design level principles. So we can we can, and I'm not going to go into detail on all of these, but each methodology has its own set of 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 principles that are at the, are at the level of designing, and and some I would pick out would be the axle rods use the principle of playful construction so that people uh, you and, and there's is a design methodology so if you're doing a design methodology get into that experimental prototyping playful construction mode to test out some of your ideas the uh, uh, Kathy Dunham's background was in adult learning so so she she uses adult learning as one of her principles so one of the things that she says is don't ask people to tell you, don't ask people to create lists of things that you that you already know the answer to. Keep it, keep it really good, meaningful work. Gil Steele, who I got the magic is in magic in is in the principles from, said, um, explore the context before deciding. So spend some time really thoroughly exploring the context. Wiseboard um, have some quite practical principles around full attendance and the number of hours it takes. So don't short shortchange the process is quite key for them uh, in in theirs. And and I think the the final one that I think is worth noting is a lot of them have this notion of having a compelling purpose, being clear about what you're what you're trying to do. So there's a whole range of, and, and once you've decide, decided to choose a methodology, you have to understand the underpinning principles for that methodology and the design level principles that it means to use that methodology. So I put them all together. There's a there's a ready interventions cube and there's somebody else's interventions cube. So I thought, hmm, what if I put them all together in a Julie Beeden cube? <laughs> so what I've what I've done as an example here is um, the at the bottom end of the cube are the widening the circle. They're they're the kind of I've I've used the axle rod ones at the top there, and then I've put a whole load of event level principles along the top. And then I've put the engagement, the the design engagement, applying all those principles to the actual event and to the work afterwards. So you can start to put these principles together into a Rubik's Cube for yourself to, to, to kind of like strap yourself into what does it mean to work with this methodology. So I've created a, a, a booklet and anybody who wants this booklet could have this booklet from me. Um, but it, the booklet starts with this map of the field of large group interventions. And what it shows you is that there are some methods that are for planning and shaping the future, some that are very, very adaptive. You can you can use them in loads of different situations, some that are really um supporting technologies so they're they're the kind of things that you could just use in any large event so they're they they don't belong with any set large group intervention you like like the um the one that i think uh, a lot of people have have experimented with um is things like i've i've done drum cafes so i and that's ex, that's uh, we we did a large group intervention um, for a few hundred people, it was more towards large meeting, semi-large group intervention. But one of the things that they wanted to experience was uh, working in harmony and alignment. And so we got drummers and the drummers taught different sections, completely different beats. And then they put it all together into a salsa by the end of the of the session. So they got a real experience of that Um doing different things but it actually creating an integrated whole at the end so those are those are interesting things that you can weave into the other methods and then there are there are a set of methods that for that are for doing work design 
at either the job design level right the way through to the to the designing redesigning the whole organization so i i group them together and then the other thing that i did a long time ago is i said well which method which method do i choose and i created a kind of logic tree that says, first of all, ask yourself, do you want to create a, a future plan or strategy? Do you want to redesign your organisation? Do you want to make some decisions or have some important conversations? And then I, I ask a load of questions underneath those to get you to the stage that by the time you've gone through all the questions, you get to a methodology. So if you want to create a strategy, <laughs> so it just leads you all the way through to... The, and and I know this is a good picture because Tony van der Zaan put it in her book. <laughs> so I've quoted her a lot, but she quoted me when she used when she used this book. <laughs> so what what I what I've done in my booklet is I've then taken I've then taken each of the of the methodologies, each of the uh, of the different methodologies, and for each for each of the methodology, I've said, what's the purpose of this methodology? What principles does it work with at the whole method level and at the uh, at the event level? What's the typical process? What's the role of the planning team? Every every large group intervention uses a, a microcosm of the whole system as a planning team. No, you never. If if you're going to plan a large group intervention with just the HR people and the com, com, communications people in the room, you're designing a large event. You're not doing a large group intervention because you start the whole system thinking in the design process. The role of the planning team is different in different in different methodologies. So I've outlined what the role of the of the planning team, and that, then I've also said some design con consideration, some design considerations that are worth talking about. So we we can we can look at this and we can think, oh, okay, I understand basically how that works, and I can see some design considerations. So if I've got to the stage that there's a couple I'm trying to choose between, or I'm thinking about them, or I'm planning to start to think about doing them, I can think about the the whole thing. And uh, my 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 thinking was that it would help people if they wanted to find a consultant to do the work. To, to know enough to have a good conversation with the with the with the consultant about the work, um, and if you're somebody who's done quite a lot of OD work, uh, it's enough to get you a bit of a a bit of an understanding. You then would probably, if you really wanted to learn how to do it, go to some of the books and other resources. But at least this helps you get to the stage where you can really understand the choice that you're making, and that's that's what I wanted to do with this as a resource for 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 this. I, I don't think it would be fair for me to finish without saying when you shouldn't use LGIs because they're not some kind of, I, I, I there's loads of times when I say, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't think that's a good idea. Or I start with a planning team and we decide, no, this is not, this is not what the system needs right now. So if the issue is not very important, don't bother. <laughs> If the task is incredibly abstract, so it could end up just being a kind of talking shop and likely to just lead to talking around in circles and not lead towards action. It's probably not, you know, you could do other things to explore it. If some individual professional experts could just get on with it and do it, don't waste the time of the whole system. If you're doing just one way telling people what to do. It isn't a large group intervention and, and you could do a, 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 a client who I once had, who was head of strategy and communications for a massive, huge bank said that um, if you're doing information transfer, the best way to do that is over the internet. Then you get people to get together to make meaning of the information, but you don't need to get them together to just give them the information. And I thought that was a really good insight from her. So she wouldn't do basic cascade because she said it was a waste of time. She used to say, 
my managers shouldn't be cascading the information. They should be facilitating their staff making meaning of the information that's been cascaded other ways. I have discovered the hard way that highly charged political situations do not lend themselves very easily to large group interventions. And if it, it that off, and, and partly because important groups will not or cannot participate. So if there is an important voice that can't be part of it, then either don't do it or or plan to do it when they can. And if you if if you Marvin talks about learn learn to say no so your yes means something. Say no if people haven't got the resources, time, energy, or 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 are ready to 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 let people influence. So that you really shouldn't use it if those are the if those are the things that that are going on for you, because the risk is that you will do these events and you will increase cynicism and resistance, and then and then people just won't trust it, and the next time you want to do one, they 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 won't. And and you'll you'll get a whole load of apathy, and you'll get if people aren't invited, that you'll get a load of alienation from them. So there's a whole load of risks involved in 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 doing it badly. So be careful about that. And I think the final thing I'm going to leave everybody with is pitfalls to avoid for three different. For in, from three different angles. Leaders, if you already know what people think and you know what's best <laughs> and you just need to tell people to go do it and you don't think you need OD professionals, you're probably not going to have great success with your large group intervention. <laughs> professionals, OD professionals, if you take an expert role and you don't welcome the cynicism, anger and resistance that you meet as a learning opportunity for what will work in this system. If you fail to spend some time really investing in understanding where the leaders are at and supporting them in walking into this aligned and ready to lead the the system. If you are tempted to say yes when you know it's not going to work. And if you say no when it could work, <laughs> you're, not, you're probably not doing the system any favours. And one of my mottos is, uh, you can make anything work with a large group. As long as you get the right people in the design, um, you can make anything work. Just figure it out. And uh, to to both groups, I would say, don't get together and plan one-off events if there's no connection to a wider change. Don't go, oh, it's too hard and limit it all down so that it's hardly anything. Don't raise high expectations and do not, do not, do not try to plan it without getting the wisdom of the system into the planning process. Because the guy in the corner who folds his arms and says this is nonsense might only be one person in your planning group. But when you get into the big room and there are 30, 40, 50 of them, you won't be expecting it and you won't. It'll throw you off. It will throw you off completely. At, but I've I've gone into sessions. I've understood that from the people in planning. I've understood where they're coming from. And I'm expecting that at the beginning of the event. And we did a, we did an event once for an organisation. And we, we had them name their tables at the beginning of the day. And one table named themselves Cynics R Us at the beginning of the day. So we knew where we stood with them. <laughs> <laughs> and every time we did a piece of work, they would do the feedback. And throughout the day, they were saying, cynics are half of us. <laughs> and at the end, this guy stood up and said, well, as the one cynic remaining. <laughs> 
And it was just great kind of real time feel for the change that had happened in the room. Um, so, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that was okay to have that table called Cynics R Us if I hadn't realised how strong the cynicism was in the planning team. And you've got to love cynics too if you're going to do this work. On behalf of everyone, thank you, Julie, for such comprehensive explanation of large group intervention. Um, you bring so much life and energy um, to the screen. So even watching the video, I get excited about some of the teaching you have. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and make your thinking so accessible, available to the audience. And I, on behalf of everybody, are very grateful to you for taking time to do this. And for those of you who want to keep in touch with Julie, please contact her directly. All her information resources are at the end of the video. So, so may I just say goodbye to um, all of you. Thank you for watching this and thank you, Julie.